Shall we speak on Bhagavad Gita or Jiva Goswami? Today's is it's his appearance day, Jiva Goswami. Jaya Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jai Jai Radha Madhava Kunjabi Hari Jaya Gopijana Vallabha Giri Vardhamuri Jaya Gopijana Vallabha Giri Vardhamuri Dana Raja Dana 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 Jamuna Tira Havan Chahi Hamuna Tira Hamuna Tira Hamuna Tira Hamuna Kunjabi <laughs> Jaya 
ध्याय घोर हरि भो हरि भो हरि भो ध्याय घोर हरि भो ध्याय ध्याय प्रभु भान प्रभु भान प्रभु भान ध्याय ध्याय प्रभु भान पाठ की जाए वन डे रूप सनातन रघु ये गो श्री जीव गोपाल गो हे राध हे रज के चिथे चल लिथे हे नंद सुनु कतान हे गोवर्धान What is the second verse of the Sad Goswami Astakam? Yeah, that's it. That's it. Yeah, that's it. Na na shastra vichar na ipani pano sad dharma samstapa ko ho ho. लोकनाम हितिभुवने मनो सरण्याको हो हो राधा कृष्ण पधार विंद बजना नंदेन मिखो हो हो बंदे रूप सनाथ नौ रघु यघो श्री जीव गोपाल घो हो हो सो टुडे इज द अपीयरेंस डे ऑफ शीला रूप शीला जीव गोस्वामी बंदे रूप सनाथ नौ रघु यघो श्री जीव गोपाल घो The six Goswamis of Vrindavan are the embodiment of the teachings of Sri Caitanya Mahaprabhu. Anything that is that we follow now are coming from the teachings of Mahaprabhu through the six Goswami. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Mukti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine. नमस्ते सरस्वती देवे गौरवाणी पचारिणे निवृषे सून्यवादी पश्चात्यदे सतारिणे पंचकल्प थ्रुभ्य कृपा सिंधु पे पचा पठिता भावनेभ्यो वैष्णवेभ्यो नम नम जय श्रीकृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गदाधर शिवासरी गौर भक्तवृंद Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So um Lord Chaitanya compiled his teachings in the form of his words to the six Goswamis of Vrindavan particularly Srupa Goswami Sanatan Goswami these two received direct instructions from lord chaitanya and on the basis of the process of bhakti yoga pure devotional service rupa goswami has written the books that are the foundation for our practice in devotional service such as bhakti rasamrita sindhu and ujwala and that's sorry not but but upadesh amrita Is my class that bad? You know. Okay. Okay. He's he's thinking. I don't know what I'm saying. So he's he's mad. He's making fun of my my my. Yeah 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 yo 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 yeah 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 ooh 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 da ga da da puzzle puzzle. Okay. 
here comes the cause of all causes right here. He's, he's the one that's at fault. He did it all. <laughs> okay, so that's... Any questions? <laughs> He's got that one right anyway. Before that was all goo goo gaga gaga gee gee goo goo wa wa <laughs> ooh ooh ah uh, ah. Uh. Okay, conference is over. Okay, GBC meeting is over. Okay. <laughs> Good Boys Club, GBC. So, mm. yeah, so I'm afraid to start again. He's going to. So, Rupa Goswami is the founder. He's called Ab Ab Abhideya Acharya. And uh, there is the Sambandha Acharya, Sanatan Goswami, Abhideya Acharya. Rupa Goswami and Prayojana Acharya is Raghunath Das Goswami. So these three are the foundational principles who actually taught the science of bhakti. But one who supported all that teachings in a very shastric way was Srila Jiva Goswami. Uh, Jiva Goswami is known as the most prolific of all of the uh, Vaish, Gaudiya Vaishnavas in writing the teachings of Lord Chaitanya in scriptural form or the evidence of scriptural teachings. He's taking the revealed scriptures and taking it to higher levels of philosophical understanding. So Jiva Goswami has written 400,000 verses which is amazing when you think about it, 400,000 verses. And his most notable work is the Sandarbhas. He gave us the six Sandarbhas, Tattva Sandarbha, uh, the uh, Bhakti Bhaktiya Sandarbha, Paramahansa Sandarbha, um, Bhakti Sandarva, Priti Sandarva, and uh, what else? Krishna Sandarva, and ultimately, in a summarized form of all the Sandarvas, he gave Kramya Sandarva. So these, the Srila Prabhupada has recommended we read and try to study them. Of course, what he does is he takes arguments from the Shastras or principles from the Shastras and explains it in, from different angles of vision. Mahajano yena katasampanta. No one can understand scripture simply by reading scripture. It's not possible. One has to hear the knowledge of scripture from those who are practicing scripture in, their, in a perfectional way. So that this verse Mahajano Yena Katasapanta means one must accept a bona fide spiritual master who knows and um, was, what is that word Tasma Guru Papadyeta Jigyasa Srayutama Sabde Parechara Nishnatma Brahma Upasraya Srayam. Um, one who knows the scriptures, teaches the scriptures and practices the scriptures perfectly is called the Acharya. Acharya, one is one who teaches by example. Sometimes we want to know what is the difference between the word guru and Acharya. And we use the word Acharya in relationship to those who are in the position of guru. But the word Acharya means one who teaches by example. There's those who teach philosophical knowledge and those who teach that knowledge perfectly by their behavior and their teachings towards others. 
and that's an acharya. Um, so the, the Goswamis, although they are called Goswamis, because they are noted for vairagya, vairagya vidya nija bhakti yoga. So vairagya is the principle by which the Goswamis uh, lived their life. They were as renounced as possible. The renunciation of the Goswamis in terms of their personal care was so minimum that it was... The reason why is that they were so absorbed in devotional service, they had no time to eat, they had no time to sleep. It's not that they didn't want to eat or sleep, they just didn't have any time. It's not that they were in anxiety, they were so absorbed in devotional service, they forgot. <laughs> that is our line of teaching. That's and the Jiva Goswami is, of course, he spent so much time studying revealed scriptures and compiling so much teachings based on his studies that uh, he simply he lived for eighty-five years. He was eighty-five years old when he actually disappeared from the planet. Born in, uh, born in 1511 and left the world in 1596. So he was 85 years old. He was seven years old, or maybe a little younger, actually, when he first met Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was traveling, and he stopped in a place called Ramakali. Ramakali was the seat of the government at the time, and Sanat and Rupan Goswami were government ministers. They had t accepted the um, service of these government ministers in order to protect the Brahminical community. Uh, the Islamic rule at the time was very terroristic, and they were threatening the Brahmin community unless the Brahmin community uh, uh, accepted them as the rulers and served them. So, in order to protect the Brahminical community, Sanatana and Rupa Goswami left their positions as strict Brahmins and took up the service of Mohammedans, which means, actually, it means that one is in a fallen condition if one does that. But they did it simply to protect the Brahminical community from being harassed by the Islamic rule at the time. Uh, and then they took up names, uh, Dabir Khas and Sarah, Sarak Mulak. <laughs> Jiva Goswami was their nephew. They had one other brother, his name was Vallabha. Vallabha was, was the third he, of the th three brothers, and his son was Jiva. Vallabha got the mercy of Lord Chaitanya, and Lord Chaitanya really blessed him, and he also changed his name to Anupam. He gave him a new name. But he left the world quite young, and Jiva Goswami took shelter of his two uncles, Sanat and Rupa Goswami, and assisted them at that time. Uh, the life of Jiva Goswami is really uh, quite interesting. He preached things that were apparently different than what the Shastras presented in order to destroy Sahajianism or pre those who are pretentiously following spiritual life but were practicing something different. In other words, we call them Sahajias, those who think, take things cheaply. Uh, there were many groups that had arisen right after the disappearance of Lord Shaitan. Well, actually, some significant time after the disappearance. And sometimes they would claim, you know, to be followers of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and would try to act out his different philosophies in the form of his uh, teachings. Um, there was two aspects to Krishna's relationship with the gopis in Vrindavan. One is called Swakya Ras and the other one is called Parakya Ras. Swakya Ras means married and Parakya Ras means lawless love or 
boyfriend and girlfriend. Uh, in the spiritual world, that is the highest. In the material world, it's the lowest. <laughs> Yeah, those who, in other words, married life is considered to be civil, civil life in the material world. Whereas boyfriend, girlfriend, especially if both are married and they have a relationship on the side, that is called, it's considered to be very degraded, abominable, uh, cheating, whatever you want to call it. But in the spiritual world, that's the highest form of love because... The gopis apparently are married to other cowherd boys, but they leave their husbands in order to associate with and have loving relationships with Lord Sri Krishna. And that is considered the highest. So those who were claiming to be followers of Lord Chaitanya were pretentiously accepting this parakya, which is the highest form of loving relationship, and they were acting these out on the material level. So Jiva Goswami, in order to somehow or other divert their attention away from that, he presented Swakya Ras as being higher than Parakya Ras, which is not actually correct in terms of it, the essence of its spiritual flavor. The highest spiritual flavor is Parakya Ras. And the highest flavor is Madhurya Ras. All other Rasas get their flavor from Madhurya Ras, which is the highest. This sounds a little esoteric, and it is. <laughs> but um, what Jiva Goswami did is that he presented Svakya Ras as higher than Parakya Ras in order to destroy this pretentiousness. Because people, we are instructed, all by Srila Prabhupada, not to try to enter into these higher mellows of Krishna's loving relationship with his eternal concepts in the spiritual world unless we are completely free from all sex desire and fixed in Krishna consciousness. Otherwise, it will be misunderstood as some boy and girl and it looks like something of the material world. But it's the difference between iron and gold. Both are metals. One is very valuable, the other one is very base. One is very hard to get, and the other one is, what we say, available everywhere. So um, if we, or if anyone, sees Krishna's relationship with his eternal associates as being something similar to what goes on in this world as boy and girl relationship, that is sahajjadism, that is, that's actually offense. Because ultimately on the highest platform of spiritual understanding, the whole principle is that no one in the spiritual world is trying to access anything for their own pleasure, they're only trying to give pleasure to others. There's no personal motivation on the spiritual platform. Everything is for the benefit of the, uh, the other person. And so unless we can understand that as the principle of spirituality, we, we look at the gopis who appear to be acting for their own gain, but they're only trying, only trying to please Krishna. And Krishna looks like he's apparently acting for his own gain, but only he's only trying to please the gopis. So there's not a tinge or even an iota or even a pinch of personal motivation in that relationship. It is completely selfish and it's the highest form of loving expression. And so Jiva Goswami, in order to keep that precious gem intact and not be challenged by these persons who are unqualified and imitating that, he preached something different and that happens sometimes, you'll see. That's just like Lord Buddha, for example. Uh, Lord Buddha, Prabhupada said, he is the incarnation of the Supreme Lord. He is Krishna himself. But he came not as Krishna. And what did he teach? You know, Krishna teaches in the Bhagavad Gita, Vedanta, Bit, Veda, Vedanta Krit, Veda Vit, Eva Chahum, that I am the compiler of the Vedas, I am the knower of the Vedas, 
and the Vedas are meant to know me. Krishna says that. But Buddha said, forget about the Vedas. <laughs> Just follow the Eightfold Path of Dharma, which is the highest principles of moral, of moral activity. So what did he do? He threw the Vedas out. He said, forget about the Vedas. Why did he do that? Because people were using the Vedas in the wrong way. And therefore he reestablished a teaching that appeared to be religious, but it was only moral, moral practice, but because it's coming from him, and he is the Supreme Lord, those who worship Buddha, at least at that time, were worshiping the Supreme Lord, but not being aware of that. <laughs> and still, they get the benefit. What was the reason? Well, people were using the animal sacrifices, which are part of the Vedas, and taking advantage of that, not qualified to perform the sacrifices, and simply killing the animals in order to eat the flesh of the animals, which is, you know, just sinful. And so in order to stop that, that became quite rampant at the time, he said, forget about the Vedas. He protected the animals from being exploited and at the same time it protected these people from committing sinful activities. And then the whole Buddhist religion grew up. So you see an ex another example that God is teaching something less. <laughs> He's teaching something less. And he's teaching something contrary to his original teachings. He's saying, forget about the Vedas. Where he is called, he's called Vedasara. You know, one who knows the Vedas knows, actually can know Krishna. Or knowing Krishna means to actually follow the Vedic rules. <laughs> but Krishna taught something else. So then, Buddhism spread throughout India. But then, in, but it was based on more or less atheistic principles, no more high morality, uh, but no understanding or no conception of the Supreme Lord. And then Sankaracharya came. Now, Sankaracharya is Lord Shiva, but he's coming as a, a sannyasi, and he's teaching monism. He's saying, that now we should get back onto the Vedas in the monistic way that the Supreme Lord and the living entity are non, are essentially one and the same. <laughs> There's no difference. He was teaching the impersonal and he was teaching that tatvam asi, that you are that. Tatvam asi means you are that. You are that, what is that? That means that, per, that element which is the Supreme Lord and people were taking it that way and now although he is Lord Shiva and he is Vaishnava Namita Shambhu he was teaching the highest he was teaching something different than Bhakti Yoga which he I mean he's a he's a devotee of Lord Ram Shiva and Shiva is a devotee of Lord Ram Chandra and so you see another example of how teachings are given in a less direct or in more indirect way, or sometimes even in a complete contrary way, in order to teach the time, place, and circumstance. But then again, then of course, then we had Ramanujacharya, then he came, brought people back onto the Vedas, Madhvacharya took it another stage closer, and then Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came and brought it to the ultimate understanding, a Chintya Veda Veda Tattva, that the Lord and the living entities are simultaneously one and different and inconceivable. A Chintya means that which cannot be conceived by intellectual abilities. Uh, so there's a whole history of uh, presenting the absolute truth in a very systematic way to higher and higher levels. And Mahaprabhu is the highest. He's teaching that there's an, that the living entity is one with, in quality, and different from, in quantity, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Like that. 
And to understand that is not possible. <laughs> it can only be realized through the process of pure devotional service. So Jiva Goswami was very expert at presenting arguments apparently contrary to the Vedic traditions in order to destroy many who are in the name of religion but were just practicing it in a cheating and a selfish way. Like that. And that happens throughout the history of spiritual life. People take the, the pure essence and turn it around and give it some other meaning. It's even happening now in ISKCON. <laughs> we won't go into that. <laughs> but it happens all the time. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so he was expert at, uh, and he was criticized for that also. Another very interesting part of Lord of Jiva Goswami's uh, activities is that, um, and he was very submissive and obedient to Rupa Goswami and Sanatana Goswami. They were his uncles, and he was also, you know, in a junior position. Although he had just as much or more knowledge as they did. But still, he took the humble position and always worked under their tutelage. In other words, he followed them. Um, there was one incident when one very powerful uh, debater, he was traveling through different providences, he came to Vrindavan, and he heard about Srupa and Sanatan Goswami. So he wanted to debate the, them and he had uh, amassed a whole fortune of signatures from people who he had defeated before in the past. And he kept this, what do you call it? He called it uh, something Patra, I forgot what it was called. Uh, Vijay Patra. Vijay Patra. Vijay means victory. Patra means, I guess, a compilation of all those he, he had defeated. So he wanted to add Sanatana and Rupa Goswami to his defeat, so he challenged them. And Rupa Goswami and Sanatana Goswami, they, didn't, they, they saw this person was simply a waste of time. <laughs> Why waste our time just debating this guy? Just, so they said, no, we're, and he said, well, if you don't debate me, that means I, I've actually defeated you. Well, yeah, you can say that if you want. <laughs> they didn't care. So he said, then you have to sign my Vijay Patra. So they did. We've been defeated by this person. <laughs> and so, um, you know, he left. And then he was feeling that, you know, he had defeated them. He didn't, but they just acquiesced because they didn't want to be bothered with him. <laughs> it's just a nonsense. So, but Jiva Goswami had also found out and then he was, this person showed his Vijay Patra with the names of his two uncles on it, and he said, oh, well, you have to defeat me now. And so Jiva Goswami wasn't about, he wanted to save the reputation of his uncles. That's the only reason he did that. And so he smashed them to pieces. <laughs> Jiva, nobody could debate Jiva Goswami. He was just... Jiva Goswami, and anyone who knows the, deeply the science of Krishna consciousness can take any position within the philosophical teachings and present that position and defeat the opposite party. I've seen it done. We used to do in New Vrindavan, when I was there in the old days, every Sunday we would have a debate between the two most senior devotees on Krishna consciousness. So one day, one sannyasi came, he was a very reputable sannyasi, and Kirtananda Swami, who was the head of the community, he, was, he had such knowledge of the Shastras, and he was an expert, or he was a captain of his debating team in college. So um, they decided to have a debate, and Kirtananda Swami took the position of the Mayavadi philosopher, and this the other devotee took the position of the personalism, uh, as we are taught. And Kirtananda Swami defeated him. 
I was there to watch it. <laughs> so, so if you know how to debate and you know how to twist things around, <laughs> you can defeat anybody. <laughs> even the guy next to you <laughs> because you know because mahajano yena katasu what is the first part of that verse tak uh, what is it what is that huh huh tarko pratishta sutinam vibindam what is the rest of it tarko pratishta sutinam vibindam Maha, uh, 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 yeah, something uh, yeah. Mahajanolo Gyena Katasapanta is the whole verse. That's from the Mahabharat. It's written in CC. But what it says is that a great soul is not a great soul if he if he if he doesn't differ for other from other great souls. <laughs> Each great soul has to be unique. <laughs> to be a great soul. And so, what it means that the scriptures are so variegated that you can take the scriptures and prove anything from it. Anything. Even materialistic ideas. If you know how to take those scriptures and twist the words around and make it uh, into a argument. And people do that. <laughs> I was talking, Banu Swami is one of the more, he's the most, one of the most erudite scholars in our movement. And he's also compiled Jiva Goswami Sandharvas. And that's, uh, yeah, plus so many other books he's done. But he was telling us that, you know, you can take Srimad Bhagavatam and you can, you can prove it from an impersonal point of view also. <laughs> if you know the art of what is called argument. <laughs> That's the whole thing. But Bhagavatam is clear though. Bhagavatam says, Ete cham sam kalom pum sam krishnas tu bhagavan svayam. That Krishna is the supreme personality of Godhead and all the incarnations are plenary portions or portions of a plenary portion of the supreme Lord Shri Krishna, like that. And the essence of Srimad Bhagavatam also is found on this other verse. Krishna, what is that verse? Uh, hmm. Krishna's. It's a verse about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Sangopagna saparsadam yagnai sankirtanai prayaya janti hi sumerira. What's the first line? Hmm? Hmm? What's the first word? What's the first word? Varna? Krishna Varna. Krishna Varna twasa Krishna Sangopanga saparsadam yagnai sankirtanai prayaya Yejanti hi and that in this age the incarnation of the supreme personality of Godhead appears in his form as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, along with his weapons, associates, confidential servants, and one more statement. And what is the what is the 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 essence of Bhagavatam is Harinam Sankirtan. <laughs> If you study Bhagavatam in, a, in the proper way, you'll see that ultimately everything comes about around Harinam Sankirtan. And that's the essence of Srimad Bhagavatam. And that's mentioned in the very last verse of the Bhagavatam, because the very last verse sums up the entire treatise of Bhagavatam. What is that Mahasana? What is that last verse? 12, 13, 12... 12th canto, 23rd verse, no, 12th canto, 13th chapter, 23rd verse. What is that? The last verse in Srimad Bhagavatam. It's worth reading. I always forget it. 12. Nama Samkirtanam Yasya. Sarva Papa. Sarva Papa. 
pranashanam Harim Param, and what is the... I offer my step of business, you know, to the Lord Hari. The conventional chanting of whose holy names destroys all sinful reactions and the offering and the offering of basis is unto whom relieves all material suffering. Oh, hmm. well, that verse crowns, puts the crown on Harinam Sankirtan as the essence of destroying all material desires, purifies the heart and spreads the glories of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Highly recommended, not highly, but foremostly recommended in this age in, in Kali Yuga. That's Bhagavatam. Um, Jiva Goswami also explains uh, another principle that is very interesting, when you have contradictory principles that come from various scriptures, where do you, how do you settle the ultimate? You have to go to, just like you say, uh, for instance, um, the highest person within the society will might be the the president, and then the president has governors, each particular section of the country has a governor, and then you have a governor, then you have the people below him, like that. You can get knowledge about a particular subject matter from everyone, anyone who has some position within society, but if you want to get the complete understanding, you go to the top person. So in the same way, Bhagavatam is Amalam Pranadam, it's Paramahansa Samhita. It is considered to be the topmost authoritative principle which, which recognizes the essence and that is worship of the Supreme Personality Sri Krishna in his form of Radhan Krishna and Sri Vrindavan Dham is the ultimate principle of devotional practice and the goal of devotional life. <laughs> Both. So, uh, yeah, we want to understand things clearly because there are many persons who like to present things in a less clear way, just to be, just like when you listen to classes, um, you also have to be able to see what is being said and understand it in relationship to the highest principle because if it's not understood in that way it either has a secondary meaning that's being applied or it may be contrary to the ultimate goal of devotional service like that and that's the difference between anukulena and pratikul what is favorable and what is unfavorable so Jiva Goswami is a more, very unique personality uh, presenting the Shastras both in the clear and complete way, tearing apart all of the uh, slokas from various sections of the Shastras and explaining them in, in various meanings without changing the essential meaning and at the same time presenting contrary arguments in order to destroy cheating forms of religion. Because Bhagavatam says, Dharma Projito Kaitavo Parama Nimatsara Satam that uh, Dharma Projito, Projito means to kick out. Kick out what? Kaitavo. What is Kaitavo? Cheating. Anything that doesn't teach pure devotional service to the Supreme Lord is considered to be a cheating form of religion. In other words, something less than the absolute truth. And people worship the Lord and practice various types of religious activities in order to gain material benefits. That is the, what we say, the essence of today's execution of religious. Most people are, they're religious because it, it's good material business. <laughs> It's good material business. 
But religion means ultimately to, to follow the laws of God and come to the platform of understanding that I am the eternal servant of the Lord and my only occupation, Sanatan Dharma, there are so many dharmas, but there is Sanatan Dharma. Sanatan means eternal, and that eternal dharma, dharma comes from the word dri, di, di means essence. So the essence of something is its dharma, just like the dharma of sugar is sweetness, the dharma of chili is pungent or hot. So the Dharma of the living entity is to love and service the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That is our Dharma and that is called Sanatan Dharma. It doesn't change when the material energy also shifts. It's, it's eternal. That's why it's called Sanatan. That you can't change. <laughs> you can only forget about it, but you can't change it. You may not like who you are. I'm an eternal servant of God. Oh, no, man, I want to be something else. <laughs> I want to be an eternal servant of uh, Joe Pizza Maker, you know. He, you know, because he, 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 he gives more pleasure to people than God does. <laughs> but you, you're stuck. That's who you are. Sorry about that. <laughs> Whether you like it or not, you're the eternal servant of the Lord. Can't get away from it. Can't change it. And you've been stamped. You've been molded. <laughs> That's it. What to do? <laughs> Accept it. <laughs> That's the whole thing. Uh, there are people who don't like themselves because they because self. What is self hate? You ever heard about that? People hate themselves. Why? because they want to enjoy and their nature is not to enjoy. Our nature is not to enjoy, our nature is to give enjoyment. And through giving enjoyment, we enjoy. But when we try to enjoy without giving enjoyment, it's contrary to our nature and people don't like that. Therefore, I don't like myself. <laughs> because it's, it's contrary to what I want to be. I want to be the enjoyer, separate from everything else, and I can't be. Therefore, I hate myself <laughs> because it's not me. I want to be something different. You can't, and so ultimately. If you want to enjoy, you have to give enjoyment to, uh, to others, especially Krishna. Mm -hmm. And then you find enjoyment. When you give enjoyment to others, even in the material world, there is some happiness that comes from that. But the ultimate principle of happiness is give enjoyment to Krishna. And then your enjoyment reaches higher and higher levels of satisfaction. Okay, so um, little anything else about Jiva Goswami that's worth? Oh yeah, when Rupa Goswami heard that Jiva Goswami had defeated this person, he became angry at Rupa Goswami, at Jiva Goswami, and he banned him from Vrindavan. He said, to live in Vrindavan means trinata peace and niche na tayori vyasa hishnu na. You're not acting like that, so you can't stay in Vrindavan. And so he left. And then he was living, uh, he was living, he went into a hole and started living there and was just living basically on just a little bit of uh, uh, chickpeas and some uh, some chapati dough, not even cooked. And Sanatan Goswami was feeling sorry for him, so eventually he took him out. Actually, Jiva was so weak he couldn't even walk. And then he wanted to get the favor of Rupa Goswami, so Sanatan Goswami used the trick to uh, get Rupa Goswami's favor for Jiva Goswami. So he said to uh, Rupa Goswami, what are, what are the principles that we live by? Taught by Lord Chaitanya. And Rupa Goswami said, what are the three principles? It was uh, um, Nam Ruchi, Vaishnav Seva, and Jiva Doya. <laughs> so when he said Jiva Doya, <laughs> Then Sanatana Goswami smiled and said, Yeah, you should be, you should be doya to Jiva. <laughs> 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 
Doya means mercy. <laughs> and so then when Jiva, Rupa Goswami said, hey, all right, bring him back. <laughs> But he accepted, although it apparently wasn't, uh, it was a little bit harsh, the punishment, he accepted it because, you know, he was very obedient to his, uh, to Rupa and Sanatana Goswami. Okay, so any questions today is Jiva Goswami's appearance day. It's also the appearance day of Jagadish Pandit. Also, anyone like to add something philosophical, controversial? No, nothing? Right? Um, I think you're talking about Gopal Bhatta Goswami. Oh, okay. I'm mixing up the two. Yeah. When Lord Chaitanya went to, uh, uh, what was it, in Tirupati, mm. he stayed at the house of Mankata Bhatt, mm. and his, that was the father of Gopal Bhatt. Mm. Uh, he received the remnants there. Mm -hmm. And then after that, he came to join. So, yeah, Gopal Bhatta Goswami. He's also quite a powerful charya. Mm. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, I'm by the door there. Yeah. Looks like I'm getting froze out, freezing out. It just went on. I guess that was the signal to get get off the Vyasa. So. <laughs> I would just like to ask you, Maharaj, if you could uh, maybe elaborate. I'm a little confused when you said that uh, people are religious because it's a good business. Yeah. But. Uh, I, I know at least two verses, there are more, but I remember two out of the head is Akama Sarva Kama Moksha Kama Tudarane, yeah. Tivrena Bhakti Yogena, yeah. Gijeta Sarva Parishan, yeah. And the other one is, uh, this one which I quoted is that whatever desire you have, you just worship the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yeah, and the right. other one is from Chaitanya Charitamrita, Sarva Krita Hoy. Yeah. But that's true because they're in the right place, whatever you... But you ultimately have to purify those desires to come to the stage of bhakti. You have to give them up. Even if you're Sarva Kama, full of material desires, still chant the holy names of the Lord, still worship the Supreme Lord. But it doesn't mean that they're, they're they've given up that those material desires. That comes with the process. That's why Prabhupada would say, they say, well, you know, the Christians say, give a, give us our daily bread. So that's part of the prayer. So they pray for bread. <laughs> in Srimad Bhagavatam, in the prayers of uh, of Pralat Maharaj, there is one. I found out one similar verse about this where. Pralat Maharaj is also saying, give, give us our food or something, maintain us. I don't know exactly the quote, but... I no, Pralat Maharaj is a pure devotee. He's not praying for anything material. He's praying, he's, he's praying to the Lord, please let me stay in this material world to save the fools and rascals who have made a humbug civilization. Let me stay here and accept... Uh, let me accept the hardships of preaching to them. That's what he. That's his prayer to the Supreme Lord. He's not praying for anything for himself. Uh, when the Lord wanted to give him some material benefit, he told the Lord, 
I am not a Vanik. Vanik means merchant. So he, he rejected that. So, um, but there are people who practice, and this is the general population, they go to church, they go to God to improve their material life. They pray like that. You see that even in our temples, you don't see it so much here because you don't really know the consciousness of everyone. But I see many of our temples, people come and they offer something onto the altar and they stand there praying, you know, make my son, you know, best marks in class. And there was one lady, she was, uh, she went to the Bhaktivedanta Manor her son was going to school, I think high school or something. So she was standing in front of the deities playing really hard. Please give my son A's in all his ten subjects. He had ten subjects. This was told to me directly. Um, and uh, the boy got nine A's. He didn't get ten A's. She went back and complained to the Lord. I asked for ten and he only gave me nine. Yeah. So people actually worship the Lord a lot for, you know, give me a, a, a rupam dehi, yaso dehi, janam dehi, danam dehi, dehi. Dehi means give me. <laughs> give me wealth, give me followers, give me a nice wife, give me good kids, Give me a, a computer that doesn't break down. <laughs> the whole list goes on, you know. So this is this is the trend within society. People generally worship the Lord for some. That's why we don't tell people exactly what we're about until they actually start practicing. <laughs> then they freak out. <laughs> and then you see they don't stay too long. <laughs> We, we, we attract them in a very nice way and then ultimately we tell them got to give it all up. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you, then you'll see that Sunday feast diminishes in numbers. <laughs> yeah. So this is, yeah, Generally, there are two defects and two principles that govern worship. One is, I worship God to become God, or I worship God in order to get something from God. That is, that very few, very few, hardly any living entities actually worship God with the desire to please God and go back to the spiritual world. It's very few. <laughs> Even in even in the Hare Krishna movement, <laughs> but that doesn't mean you quit. St stick to it, and then gradually take it step by step. If you take it step by step, then it's not a problem. If you try, that's why we don't tell everybody everything at the beginning because it's too much for them. <laughs> Give it step by step. Take prasad, chant. Dance, have fun, read nice philosophy, talk to nice people. Hey, why not? Sounds good. I want to join the club. <laughs> but, Taktuat Deham Purna Janmani, Naiti Mameti Sarjana, to go back home, back to Godhead, one has to be fully purified. Prabhupada said, even if you desire one sweet ball, that'll keep you in this material world in another birth. Yeah. So yeah, this is this process is very rare and very exclusive. It's the essence of spirituality. But the good point is Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Krishna taught the same thing that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was teaching. People couldn't follow Krishna. It was too much. But Mahaprabhu made it so nice and so easy and so He's so compassionate that he's including everyone and anyone. The Prabhupada said, in the uh, in Sankara Shampardaya, 
you can't practice unless you are a sannyasi. You can't even practice unless you are a sannyasi. That's where you start. <laughs> but Mahaprabhu says, you know, anyone, you know, Jagai, Madai, come, chant Hare Krishna, dance, take some prasadam, and, you know, be a lover of God. <laughs> Mahaprabhu's mercy is unlimited. He's, he's slackened all the rules and regulations and made it so available to so many people. That's why in this age, Mahaprabhu is the manifestation of the Supreme Lord that we worship. We can't approach Krishna. It's not possible. We can only approach Krishna through Mahaprabhu. Yeah. So we're very fortunate here. We have not only Mahaprabhu, but we have the whole Panchatattva. So this temple is the mercy manifestation in its ultimate principle here. You, it's the highest. You can't get any higher than here. Not only one, but five. <laughs> they all exhibit Mahaprabhu's mercy <laughs> in different ways. <laughs> yeah, Panchatattva yeah, is the highest <laughs> in terms of doya. <laughs> Even if you don't have any qualifications, if you chant Hare Krishna and just try to be a nice boy, nice girl, <laughs> you can make it in this process. <laughs> so. Yes, question. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Uh, you said that um, we don't uh, preach to the newcomers until they start processing and then we tell them to give it all up. Aren't we actually following Yukta Vairagya to include everything in the process? Yukta Vairagya in which way? In the way that we... Um, Pull it down a little bit? Yeah, okay. That we do not... Uh, our process is not like minus Maya but plus Krishna to include... I mean, I know there are like... Uh, um, Yamas and niyamas, but uh, what is favorable, what is not favorable, but what is actually favorable, we can well, include. That's, yeah, yeah. That, that's the scriptures teach both. They teach what is favorable and they teach what is unfair. Yeah. That you have to learn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that you have to learn. But still, it's not like a process is giving it all up, no? Hmm? It's not like the process is giving it all up. Is it's it? a gradual process. Yeah. We don't expect people to be, you know, pure in the, when they first come in here in terms of their intention. Mm. We simply ask people to chant Hare Krishna, engage in devotional service, and be happy. That's all. That's, right. <laughs> That's it. But then again, as you practice, you start to learn. Well. You know, where am I going? <laughs> What's the direction? The goal is pure love of God. That's the, that's the goal. And when you understand what pure love of God is, then you have to understand that it doesn't include anything material. <laughs> So, but never get discouraged because Lord Chaitanya's mercy is freely flowing. Just continue to stay, chant, dance, and be happy. <laughs> and if you can start chanting without offense, then you'll get higher and you get a higher taste. When there's no offense to your chanting, then the taste of Krishna consciousness becomes very sweet. And then you think, there's nothing else I want, you know, this is it. So we have to come to a fenceless chanting, and then the taste comes. <laughs> but don't, when you preach to new people, just invite them to take part in the activities. And just tell them some basic stuff that, like that. But, you know, gradually, the philosophy becomes more and more acceptable as we engage more and more in the process. 
There are very few that can accept the philosophy even before they practice. There are people like that, but they're really in small numbers. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Maharaj. Uh, you know, in the class, Guru Maharaj, you said that most religions are teaching differently. They say, or people worship God to get something or to become God. But our religion... Oh, just go to these churches and listen mm -hmm. to the sermons. Mm -hmm. You can hear it yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, it's not a big thing. It's there. It's right in front of you. And, and we say that we are worshipping God because we want to please God. And you said we want to go back to the spiritual world. But you said very few people, even within our ISKCON, want that. You mentioned that. Yeah, because Lord Chaitanya is inviting everyone to come. <laughs> but still, we don't really want that. Is that what you were trying to say? No, no. people will stop on the level of where they're, you know, because as you stay in the process, the process will force you to, to take the next step. And if you don't take the next step, you, you uh, go backwards. <laughs> as you associate and as you practice, you're becoming purified. And then Krishna is going to continue to arrange for you to make more progress. Mm. If you resist that mm. by holding on to your material attachments, then Krishna will try different ways to encourage you to give it up. But then when he sees you're determined not to give it up, you'll start to you'll start losing your taste in Krishna consciousness. Mm. It's a process of always going forward and not staying in one place. So we have to make a very um, conscious effort to keep progressing through right. the stages right. and not allow ourselves to get stuck at some point. Yeah. So how do you do that? What is the mindset? The mindset is always try to act in such a way as to perfect your service and to offer that service as a service to the Supreme Lord in devotion like that. Um, things you can, intermediate goals we can accept uh, which are lead to the ultimate goal is I want to chant offenselessly. So you work on your chanting. Mm. That's an intermediate goal which will lead to the ultimate goal. I want to learn more about the revealed scripture so I have a clear understanding of what this process is and I know more and I can actually develop attraction for Krishna by learning about what is Krishna? What is he like? What is his nature? How does he deal with living entities in different categories. So we can make intermediate goals that lead to the, I want to perfect my service by becoming expert in my service. I want to be the best in the area of cooking. I want to be the best in the area of pujari. So that's also, these are intermediate goals like that. So how do we actually know that we are making progress or we may think we are making progress but actually we are stuck? Well, you can tell. You can tell by how much you, your, your enthusiasm for the activities is. If you're losing your enthusiasm, that means you're, you're pretty much stuck. Hmm. And, but Prabhupada would also say, how do you know when you should stop eating when you as you're becoming full when you're eating three things happen you get nourishment you get physical uh, you get nourishment you get hunger is diminished and you get happiness happiness nourishment and, and uh, your hunger goes down your nourishment goes up and your happiness increases as you're eating and so in three things, in your progress of devotional service, you're becoming um, free from material attachments, you're becoming happy in your devotional service, and you're becoming more enthusiastic in the activities of devotional service. Mm -hmm. All these things are happening. There's a verse, it's in the 11th Canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, 11, 11, 2, what's that verse?